Now on BBC One, the BBC News with Rita Chakrabarty. Tonight, King Charles III visits Northern Ireland, continuing his tour of the nations as the new monarch. Arriving at Hillsborough Castle with Camilla, the Queen Consort, he met political leaders, including from the Republican Party Sinn Féin, and spoke of the late Queen. My mother felt deeply, I know, the significance of the role she herself played in bringing together those whom history had separated. Crowds, which have become a hallmark of the royal tour, gathered to welcome the royal couple and to exchange a few words. I, I am ecstatic. I think I am shaken. I love the royal family. I certainly love the royal family and I will be at the funeral in London. Meanwhile, the Queen's coffin was taken from St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh to begin its journey to Buckingham Palace. We'll be looking ahead at what to expect in the coming days. Also on the program, Ukrainian soldiers celebrate driving Russian troops out of key cities in the northeast as President Zelensky calls on the West to accelerate its delivery of arms. Here, unemployment falls to its lowest rate in nearly 50 years, but figures reveal pay failing to keep up with rising living costs. I've conjured a lily to light these hours and a tribute to the late Queen by the Poet Laureate Simon Armitage in a poem which spells out her first name. And stay with us here on BBC News where we will bring you continuing coverage of events plus analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. Good evening. King Charles III and Camilla, the Queen Consort, have travelled to Belfast for the King's first visit as monarch to Northern Ireland. The King and his wife greeted crowds who gathered at Hillsborough Castle, some of whom had been waiting since five o'clock this morning, hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal couple. His Majesty then went on to meetings with political leaders, including those from the nationalist parties who want Northern Ireland to leave the UK and become part of the Republic of Ireland. And the King was offered a message of condolence on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland from the Speaker of the Stormont Assembly. Our special correspondent Alan Little reports now from Belfast on the King's visit to Northern Ireland. It is his 40th visit to Northern Ireland, so he knows the village of Royal Hillsborough well. But this is the first time his car has flown the royal standard of the Sovereign. The warmth of the public welcome was unmistakable. This is what this tour of the nations is for, direct engagement, informal and relaxed, between the new monarch and the people. They lingered, devoting more time to this than the formal schedule allowed. His late mother famously remarked that she had to be seen to be believed. Public visibility is already a hallmark of the new reign. This, a gesture of gratitude for the flowers left in tribute to the Queen. The royal residence at Hillsborough has been at the heart of British and Irish affairs for centuries. As they entered for the first time as King and Queen Consort, 206 Ulster Battery Royal Artillery fired a 21-gun salute. But inside there was no disguising the tensions that still prevail here and which have suspended the Northern Ireland Assembly and devolved government. As dignitaries waited in the throne room, subdued, quiet. And I think we're all very saddened by our gods. The King greeted Northern Ireland's party leaders. Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill spoke to him of his late mother's contribution to the peace process. She played a great role here in terms of reconciliation and peace, so it's the end of an era for sure. Those sentiments were echoed more formally in an event that would once have been inconceivable here. During this period of public mourning. In the throne room at Hillsborough Castle, the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Sinn Féin's Alex Maskey, addressed the King with these words. Queen Elizabeth was not a distant observer in the transformation and progress of relationships in and between these islands. She personally demonstrated how individual acts of positive leadership can help break down barriers and encourage reconciliation. 
Queen Elizabeth showed in a small but significant gesture, a visit, a handshake, crossing the street or speaking a few words of Irish can make a huge difference in changing attitudes and building relationships. In reply, the King said he would follow what he called his mother's shining example. <clears throat> she never ceased to pray for the best of times for this place and its people, whose stories she knew, whose sorrows our family had felt, and for whom she had a great affection and regard. My mother felt deeply, I know, the significance of the role she herself played in bringing together those whom history had separated and in extending a hand to make possible the healing of long-held hurts. At St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast, people from all faiths joined the King and Queen Consort in a service of reflection for the life of Queen Elizabeth. It is the burden of the monarch to seek to unify, to stake out common ground on which to resolve differences. And here, where the legitimacy of the crown itself is challenged, the differences remain stark. Liz Truss sat beside the Irish Taoiseach, Michal Martin engaged in conversation, for they too have differences to resolve. That the new reign has begun with visits to Scotland, Northern Ireland and, on Friday, Wales, is a statement of intent. An intention to put the future of the Union at the heart of his purpose as King. At a time when many of the traditional bonds of Union are weakening, to draw the four nations of the Kingdom into a cohesive whole. Alan Little, BBC News, Belfast. The new king was given a warm welcome on the streets of Northern Ireland, but divided loyalties there mean that nationalist communities do not recognise the monarchy. During the years of conflict in Northern Ireland, the royal family themselves were affected by the violence of the Troubles, with the queen herself becoming an important symbol of peace. Our island correspondent Emma Vardy was with the crowds to witness the royal reception. In a place often defined by the divide over its sovereignty, a royal visit takes on an even greater significance. Honestly, I am ecstatic. I think I am shaken, and it's just phenomenal to even get this close to him. D did you get to shake his hand? I did indeed, yes. I near crushed the man in front of me, but I got to shake his hand. <laughs> For Unionists, the monarchy is a symbol of Northern Ireland's place within the UK and a connection to a sense of Britishness. I hope when people see this, they realise that Northern Ireland belongs to, be, belongs to be part of the UK and we want to be part of the UK and I hope that uh, continues. People have been queuing here since dawn to meet the new king, keen to show that for the British identity in Northern Ireland, a sense of connection with the royal family is as important as ever. But a divided history has also meant at times the monarchy has had a difficult relationship with this part of the UK. When the Queen first visited Northern Ireland in 1953, the state had only been created three decades before, when the island of Ireland had been partitioned. As your Queen, I am now even more closely concerned with the affairs of Northern Ireland. And behind the pomp and pageantry, there was conflict between nationalists who believed the island of Ireland should be one independent country and unionists who were loyal to the British crown. On one visit, her motorcade was attacked in Belfast when a concrete block was dropped on the bonnet of her car. During the Troubles, the violence touched the Queen's own family in 1979 when Lord Mountbatten, her cousin, was murdered by the IRA in Ireland when a bomb was detonated on their boat. But as the peace process gathered momentum, the Queen herself took part in symbolic moments of change. There was a historic handshake between Her Majesty and Martin McGuinness, himself a former commander of the IRA, the paramilitary group that had carried out many of the violent attacks during the Troubles, including on her own family. The handshake with Martin McGuinness was a clear indication that that conflict was over. And that was something that meant a lot to people like me who had stood against violence over many, many years. But that handshake 
basically clearly said, the conflict is over. Let's get on with building peace. Today, loyalty to the monarchy in unionist areas is more prominent in Northern Ireland than perhaps anywhere else in the UK. And Belfast's iconic Shankill Road has become a focal point for tributes. But today, the attention was on the royal route from Hillsborough Castle and onwards. It really means a lot to welcome the new king, uh, to sympathise with them on the death of his mother. We love the royal family, I certainly love the royal family and I will be at the funeral in London on, on the weekend as well. For Northern Ireland there is now new hope. The unifying legacy the Queen is remembered for will be continued. Well, there's been a rather sombre atmosphere here at Hillsborough over the last few days, but all that changed this afternoon to a feeling of excitement as the new king arrived. Now, of course, the very formal diplomatic side of things took place inside the castle as the king met the unionist and nationalist parties. But out here, I think for people seeing the king in the flesh, it left people with a sense of optimism and reassurance that he understood the difficulties Northern Ireland has been through and of the positive role that he can play for people here in the future. Rita. Emma, thank you. Emma Vardy reporting there. Queen Elizabeth's coffin has now left Edinburgh Airport after lying in rest at St Giles Cathedral in the city. Tens of thousands of people filed silently past her coffin in the cathedral over the last day and night. This afternoon, crowds paid their respects as the Queen departed Scotland for the last time. Our Scotland editor James Cook sent this report on the tributes in Scotland. God. From the people of Scotland to their Queen, one last act of devotion. For hours they have queued, day and night, for a few moments with their Queen. Moments they will never forget. Why do you think it's so emotional? Why has it affected you so much, do you think? Just, she's like everybody's granny. It's like your granny dying again. Um, it's just everybody's granny, isn't she? She's a nation's granny. Um, it just means so much to everybody. And, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Can I stop crying? Where do you think her death leaves this country? There's a massive void. A massive void in this country. Uh, her personality, her wit, her humour, her smile, her love, care and dedication to her family and to this country. The atmosphere is just very serene, very, very serene, and it was just so quiet, and just everybody was lost in their own thoughts, I think, as well, and just seeing it was just very emotional, very, very emotional. What is the significance of this moment in history? Well, for many people, it is simply a chance to mourn and to say thank you. For others, it is a powerful reminder of the ties that bind the nation together. But there are different views as well. Everybody has a right to protest, however, I think the clear answer... They're making a point about freedom of speech, after police made at least two arrests in Edinburgh, charging one man who heckled Prince Andrew. There have been a few people arrested in the last few days for expressing anti-monarchist sentiments in very, very peaceful ways. We're talking like people with signs, people just saying, not my king, something like that. Or in one case, someone threatened with arrest just for having a blank piece of paper. It's very much about the power of the British state. We're told that we're not allowed to question, you know, this is the wrong time, the wrong place. Yeah, I personally don't believe in having an unelected head of state, but I think that we should be able to have a conversation about it. We should be able to have a process, to share these views or change it if that's what people decide. That's how democracy should work. But this evening, all eyes were on this, the last journey, with Princess Anne accompanying her mother to London. For Scotland, the curtain has finally fallen on the era of Elizabeth. James Cook, BBC News, Edinburgh. Well, you saw there the Queen's coffin leaving Scotland for the last time. 
In the last half hour, a ceremony was held at Edinburgh Airport as the Queen's coffin was carried onto the plane by a Royal Air Force bearer party and placed on the RAF aircraft in the presence of the Princess Royal. final moments before takeoff the national anthem was played the queen's coffin is now being flown from edinburgh and is due to land at raf north halt in west london this evening our royal correspondent daniela ralph is at raf north halt for us now daniela Yes, Rita, we now know that the Queen's coffin is on its way here to RAF North Holt. It's due to land at around 10 to 7, accompanied by her daughter, Princess Anne. In what will be a week of final journeys, this will be her last to Buckingham Palace. Uh, the coffin is travelling on an RAF C-17 Globemaster. Now, just three months ago, the Queen was on the balcony of Buckingham Palace watching that same type of aircraft taking part in her Jubilee flypast. Today, a C-17 will bring her home. A guard of honour will be formed here by the Queen's Colour Squadron, the ceremonial unit of the RAF. A bearer party will convey the coffin from the aircraft to the state hearse. There will be a small ceremony here conducted in near silence. No music, no pomp. It is going to be a sober, quiet return to London for the Queen. The state hearse will then leave here to travel to Buckingham Palace along the A40 through the suburbs of West London, uh, through Marble Arch along Park Lane to Buckingham Palace, the place from where she has reigned for the past seven decades. Daniela, thank you. The Queen will spend her final night at Buckingham Palace before her coffin is taken tomorrow by procession from there to the Palace of Westminster. The coffin will leave Buckingham Palace at 2.22 in the afternoon. Crowds will be able to watch as the cortege makes the journey along the Mall, Horse Guards Parade and Whitehall. The procession will include the King and members of the Royal Family. The coffin will reach Westminster Hall at 3 o'clock for the four full days of lying in state. Members of the public will be able to pay their respects from 5 p.m. More details on how this will work have been announced. Our special correspondent Lucy Manning reports now on the preparations in London. In little more than an hour, the Queen will return to her home. But it is the saddest of journeys. Back to where she lived, where she worked, where she celebrated the end of the war, where she brought up her children, held garden parties, waved to us from the balcony, addressed us in good times and bad, the focal point of her royal life and the country's. Tomorrow, a 38-minute walk for the King and other members of the royal family behind their mother's coffin, all the way up the Mall from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall for the lying in state. Expectations are around 400,000 people will be able to file past the coffin, leaving some potentially disappointed. The fear is queues of up to 30 hours. Nevertheless, Katie from Worthing plans to return. It's no different from a concert, I guess. <laughs> Lots of people are queuing big, um, like, loads of hours for Harry Styles. So I, I think the Queen's a bit more important than Harry Styles, so I don't mind waiting. Why would it be important for you to go to the Lion State? She was roughly my age when she came to the throne and I couldn't possibly imagine becoming Queen of a country, let alone all the Commonwealth nations um, at my age. So I feel it's part of my duty to come and, like, you know, support and pay my respects. <laughs> Janet from Kent is concerned. I'm coming up Thursday and just get in a queue and hope for the best, really. So, yeah, queue as long as I can before I have to go home again. That's the biggest problem, isn't it? Can't spend all night here. The public will be kept informed where the queue has reached and an estimate of waiting time. The lying in state opens at 5 p.m. tomorrow. There will be a coloured wristband system for different zones. Once there, people can leave the queue to sit or get food. Some venues on the route will remain open to facilitate this, and the queue could be closed early if it's clear people won't reach Westminster Hall by 6.30am on Monday. This is the biggest 
challenge that TfL has ever faced. Obviously, we had the Olympics in 2012, which was itself a huge occasion, but there we knew exactly what was happening, when it was happening, and how many people were attending. This is, uh, uh, there are so many variables. In the early hours of this morning, they practiced the processional route for the lying in state. This soon the somber reality for those inside and outside the palace. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Well, my colleague Jane Hill is outside the palace and we can join her now. Jane. And Rita, just in the last few minutes, in fact, we've seen the King arrive back here at the palace after that visit to Northern Ireland. There were cheers, there was applause from the crowds as he was driven in through the gates of the palace. And there are still thousands of people standing here, I have to say, Rita, despite really very, very heavy rain now. But I've been watching these crowds as the rains got heavier. People are not moving. No one budged. And in fact, as the car was, the royal car was driven through, you could see a, a surge of umbrellas as people rushed towards the gates of the palace and tried to get another glimpse of the still new king. And then we know that tonight the king and the queen consort will be here in a couple of hours from now. They will welcome his mother, the late queen, who will be brought here to Buckingham Palace for the very last time. The Queen's coffin will be greeted by a guard of honour provided by the King's Guard and she will then be taken to the bow room in the west wing of the palace, uh, a room that she was so familiar with, that she entertained in so many times, dignitaries, celebrities. That room named for its window that looks out over the gardens of Buckingham Palace will be her resting place for tonight, for the last time, watched over by a rota of chaplains. Rita. Jane, many thanks. Jane Hill there. Well, the next few days we'll see an unprecedented security operation in London. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Samford is outside New Scotland Yard for us now. And Daniel, how difficult a task do police have to keep people safe? Well, Rita, one of the senior officers involved in this security operation described it to me, to me today as huge and complex. First, there will be the hundreds of thousands of people expected to be in London tomorrow when the Queen's coffin moves from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. They can expect to see thousands of officers on the streets. Hundreds are being sent in by other forces to uh, uh, reinforce the Metropolitan Police officers. Then there'll be the several days when hundreds of thousands of people are expected to queue to pay their last respects to the Queen. They'll need to be protected from petty criminals, but there'll obviously be a risk to that queue from terrorism too, and that will have to be mitigated. And then on Monday, there will be kings and queens, emperors and princes, presidents and prime ministers, all in one place uh, for that very, very solemn funeral. And that's obviously a very, very complex VIP protection operation but the police say they have been getting ready for this for decades and although this operation is unprecedented they are used to dealing with large events in london Rita. thanks very much daniel and you can find much more information about events over the next few days including details about how to attend the queen's lying in state at bbc news online and that is at bbc.co.uk forward slash news and also by using the bbc news app now, in other news, Ukraine, Ukraine's President Zelensky is urging his Western allies to speed up the deliveries of weapon supplies to help his troops consolidate control of the territory that they've seized back from Russia in a lightning counteroffensive over the last few days. Analysts say that Moscow has largely given up lands gained around Kharkiv in the northeast and that troops have pulled back from over the border. Ukraine says that it's retaken around 2,400 square miles of territory so far this month. The area here in purple shows the gains that Ukraine has made, and you can see quite a big change since last week. Our correspondent James Waterhouse reports now from the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. <laughs> A hug made in the Kharkiv region. This mother tells her son, I was waiting for you. I knew you would come. Her wait has felt long. Separation and Russian occupation has been painful. 
in this northeastern part of the country, Russia is being forced to let go as Ukraine retakes what was stolen. It means the town of Balaklia is now able to heal. I live nearby. Our troops approached very smartly. The Russians were shocked and were running away fast. I was telling our soldiers, thank you very much. 150,000 people have been liberated here, according to authorities, and that represents a breakthrough. The aim is to completely liberate the region and other territories occupied by the Russian Federation. Right now, there is still fighting in Kharkiv region. The cities Ukrainian forces have entered are still going through stabilization measures. Regardless, Ukraine is using its successes to try and get longer-term security guarantees from Western allies. Russia says it's fighting back. Yet today, it didn't exclude a diplomatic path. Our priority remains the promotion of sustainable relations with all international partners on the basis of mutually respectful cooperation. The negotiating table is still far away. However, Russia's losses have brought it a bit closer. Rita, there are three main reasons as to why we are at this point in this conflict. Firstly, and mainly, the level of Ukrainian resistance against one of the most powerful militaries in the world, a drastically improved army over the past few years. And then secondly, you have the Western weapons that they've used, notably the long-range precise missiles provided by mainly the US and UK, which has frustrated the Russian effort. As for the invading forces, where well, they have been plagued throughout this invasion of Europe's second biggest country with morale issues, poor planning and supply problems. And as for their so-called special military operation, well, the goals of that are blurrier than ever. James, many thanks. James Waterhouse reporting there. Now, new figures from the Office for National Statistics show that the UK's unemployment rate has fallen to its lowest level in nearly 50 years. In the three months to July, the number of people out of work dropped to 3.6%. But the squeeze on pay remains, with rises in regular pay failing to keep up with the increasing cost of living. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, reports. At the moment, unemployment is very low and vacancies are very high. In fact, they're about the same. But it's not proving as simple as getting those out of work to do the jobs. The headline jobs numbers remain strong with both unemployment and long-term joblessness down. But ordinarily, a figure like this would be driven by an abundance of jobs. This time, it's fewer people actively seeking work, driven by a record number of people registering as long-term sick, which could be related to those record NHS waiting lists. It's adding to those labour market shortages and piling on further pressure on an already weak economy. At this electrical appliance supplier in Stoke, consumers are increasingly ordering energy efficient products, but the owner can't get the staff. We're having to review our wage costs on a monthly basis because it is moving at that faster speed, but it has been an absolute um, nightmare where we're having to increase it all, t all the time. So all our costs are going up, energy costs, wages are going up, insurances are going up, everything's going up and nothing's coming down at the moment. So it is a really, really difficult time. The worst time I've seen in the 30 years since I started the business. His employees are being leafleted in the car park with job offers. Across the economy though, prices are still rising by much more than wages, especially in the public sector. So the jobs numbers remain a silver lining, but is that about to change? Faisal Islam, BBC News. Let's take a look now at some other stories making the news today. More migrants have crossed the English Channel to the UK so far this year than in the whole of 2021. The Ministry of Defence said 601 people made the dangerous journey yesterday. It brings the total for this year to 28,592. The number has increased steadily each year since 2018. The family of a 24-year-old black man who was shot by a police officer say they want to see the body cam footage from that night. Chris Cabot was unarmed when he was killed following a police pursuit in South London last week. 
The firearms officer has been suspended from the Metropolitan Police. The legendary French film director Jean-Luc Godard has died aged 91. A founder of modern new wave cinema, Godard shot to fame in 1959 with the film A bout de souffle or Breathless. President Macron said that France had lost a national treasure who had the vision of a genius. Now, in a moment, we'll have a tribute to the Queen from the Poet Laureate. But first, let's take a look at the weather. Here's Chris Fawkes. Chris. Hi, Rita. Well, for most of us, today's been a decent day with plenty of sunshine around, just a little bit of fair weather cloud like we had here in Cumbria. However, across uh, parts of the south of both England and Wales, we did have this area of thicker cloud that brought some persistent outbreaks of mostly light rain. And there's a bit more of that, that to come tonight and into tomorrow. Underneath those grey skies, we had a little bit of light rain falling there in Chaldon in the Devon area. Now, overnight tonight, that weather front that brought the rain isn't really budging very far, very fast. There will be some further outbreaks of rain, most of which won't be particularly heavy. It'll turn cloudy across Northern Ireland, but with cooler air flowing in across Scotland, Northern England, the North Midlands and North Wales, it's a cooler night with temperatures getting down into single figures for more of you. So that means quite a chilly start to the day tomorrow. Now, we'll still have this band of rain across the south to start off the morning, but increasingly into the afternoon, that will tend to fade away and pull away from Kent to give some brighter weather later in the day. Away from that band of rain, actually, it's going to be a similar day to that that we had today, most of us having some sunny spells. That said, it will be a bit cloudier for Northern Ireland, where there'll be a few light showers and a few showers also for the north and west of Scotland. Temperatures, 17 for Glasgow and Belfast. It actually turns a little bit warmer in Cardiff and London, given that it'll be a bit brighter as we head into the afternoon. However, that warmer weather isn't going to last because as we head towards the end of the week, we get these stronger northwesterly winds dragging in much cooler air from the north. Now, for those planning to attend the Queen's lying in state, for London, well, it looks like a mostly dry picture, but it will be turning a little bit cooler over the next few days. That cooling trend we also see across all of the UK, with temperatures typically, as we head into the weekend, around about 15 degrees, but it will stay largely dry. Rita. Chris, thank you. Well, in a moment, it'll be time for the news where you are, but we'll leave you with the po words of the poet laureate, Simon Armitage, who's written a poem to mark the death of the Queen. Floral tribute has two verses or stanzas of nine lines, and the first letter of each line, when taken together, spells out Elizabeth. Have a good evening. Floral tribute. Evening will come, however determined the late afternoon. Limes and oaks in their last green flush, pearled in September mist. I've conjured a lily to light these hours, a token of thanks, zones and auras of soft glare, orbing the sprays and globes. A promise made and kept for life, that was your gift, because of which here is a gift in return, Glove wort to some, each shining bonnet guarded by stern, lance-like leaves. The country loaded its whole self into your slender hands, hands that can rest now, relieved of a century's weight. Evening has come, rain on the black locks and dark Monroes. Lily of the valley, a namesake almost, a favourite flower interlaced with your famous bouquets, the restrained zeal and forceful grace of its lanterns, each inflorescence a silent bell disguising a singular voice. A blurred new day breaks uncrowned on remote peaks and public parks, and everything turns on these luminous petals and deep roots. This lily that thrives between spires and trees, whose brightness holds and glows beyond the life and border of its bloom. Tonight on BBC London, we're live outside Buckingham Palace where Her Majesty the Queen's coffin will arrive this evening and crowds have already gathered to pay their respects.
welcome to the programme. It is good to have you with us. So all eyes are on the capital this evening as the Queen's coffin uh, is expected to arrive at RAF North Holt shortly and then make the journey to here at Buckingham Palace. Um, you can see uh, the crowds have gathered, the umbrellas are up, all wanting to get a glimpse, perhaps say farewell, pause for a moment of reflection or pay their respects. And uh, as I say, all eyes are indeed on the capital. And if we just come round this way, you'll see what I mean, because if you just look at the row of tents you can see there, uh, the UK's media, the world's media, they've all been here for a few days and will remain, of course, until the state funeral. And if you think it's busy here, if you've been anywhere near central London, a uh, transport is busier, uh, the roads are busier, and you will have noticed a growing police presence. Well, today, uh, the Mayor of London has been giving more details on what is going to be the biggest security operation this country has ever seen. Here's Carl Mercer. Familiar weather perhaps, but in an unfamiliar setting. These officers from Cumbria, already in the capital, perhaps a sign of the help that London needs. And down the road, these officers from Staffordshire, all part of a nationwide effort to support the Met Police for one of its biggest ever security operations. Next week, close to 300 world leaders and their entourages are expected here for the Queen's funeral. Before that, hundreds of thousands of people will come to pay tribute to her as she lays in state in Westminster. I don't think our city's ever seen uh, the sort of presence we're going to see over the next few days. If you think about uh, the London Marathon, uh, the Carnival, uh, previous royal weddings, uh, the Olympics, it's all that uh, in one. Today we were told the army would also be lending a hand. They've done it before in times of need, like they did with the security operation at the 2012 Olympics, and when they stepped in to help during the Covid crisis at places like London's Nightingale Hospital at the Excel Centre. From today, uh, some members of the armed forces will be helping the police in relation to uh, traffic management, stewarding uh, arrangements, but the wonderful thing about our armed forces is they can be called upon to assist on any issue uh, where there is assistance required. That was always part of the plans. Uh, they arrived yesterday and the good news is uh, from today uh, Londoners and visitors will be seeing them helping uh, in the tasks that lay ahead. This morning the mayor attended a memorial service at City Hall with other dignitaries from across the capital where the new national anthem was sung. <laughs> Among those at the service, London's Transport Commissioner, also expecting a tough few days. London, in a word, is going to be incredibly busy. This is without question TfL's biggest ever challenge. But we're ready. Uh, we have our services all lined up, ready to go. We have an army of volunteers, both from uh, TfL and from the GLA. And my advice to anyone wishing to come to pay their respects to Her Majesty is to use public transport and to look at our website. We'll keep that up to date. Uh, and if you've got any questions, ask a member of staff. We're here to help you get through these next few days. Much preparation has already been done. There will be finishing touches put to plans that have been years in the making over the coming days. Carl Mercer, BBC London. Right. A sense of the scale there of what will be happening here in the capital. And uh, uh, we asked you to get in touch with some of your questions uh, that you wanted to ask us and, and, you know, practical things that you need to know. Well, Wendy Hurrell is with me. Hi there, Wendy. But first of all, let's just recap on, on what is going to be happening. Yes, well, the ceremonial part of this comes to London now, doesn't it? And tomorrow there is a procession through the streets uh, led by King Charles III, the royal family there as well. Uh, a military procession, there will be a gun salute at Hyde Park, the bells of Big Ben ringing out, and there will also be a screen at Hyde Park where people can gather and watch all of this. Now, looking at the, the sort of route and timings, um, the Queen's coffin will leave Buckingham Palace tomorrow afternoon at 14.22, 22 minutes past two in the afternoon. It takes about 38 minutes then to travel to Westminster Hall tomorrow afternoon, arriving at three o'clock. Now the route uh, is along Queen's Gardens and the Mall to Horse Guards and Horse Guards Arch, uh, Whitehall, Parliament Street, 
Parliament Square and New Palace Yard and of course you can line this route and see for yourself as the Queen's Coffin is brought through London and then from five o'clock tomorrow um, Westminster Hall is open to the public and we can go and see the Queen lying in state. And we know that these timings are precise and, and the Queen herself had signed off all of these arrangements. Um, in terms of practical things, I, I mentioned those and people have been getting in touch. Just tell us what they've been as asking and how we can answer them. Well, that's right. I mean, very practical, our viewers. And, and this is, you know, take some planning if you're joining the queue because it is going to be a very busy, a, a long queue. So we have had some questions in. They've uh, been emailing hello BBC London at BBC co.uk now first of all Alison asks uh, please can you tell me where to go to collect a wristband and start queuing to go to Westminster Hall now the government has said that there will be more details released on this at 10 o'clock this evening so we're going to be able to bring okay. you more details in our late program um, but in terms of where to join the queue we know that some people have already started queuing we spoke to a lady yesterday and they are near Lambeth Bridge on the south side of the river so that's a good indication of where it may start but it's very likely that it will snake its way right across right along the River Thames on the south side of the Thames um, we have another question Suman he are uh, they they're asking are there any bathroom facilities this is a good question isn't it and also what happens if you have to leave the queue uh, do you keep your place yeah. um, the infrastructure that has built up around central London over the last few days is extraordinary. We know there are extra portable toilets, there are water stations on hand to keep people comfortable and again we will have a little bit more detail on this this evening. Uh, the final question here from Jenny. She uh, says, as the queue will take so long, are you allowed to bring prescribed injectable medication? That's, That's a good point. It's a very good point uh, and the answer to that is yes you can. Essential medication should come with you and it's worth explaining to security staff or police at a search point what it is and, and why you need it. It is a moving queue, there won't be many places to sit down um, and so we have a very handy guide because there are restrictions as well mm. when you get to Westminster Hall that we can uh, show you on our, our website and social media channels which hopefully will help. Mm. And Wendy, what about the state funeral on Monday and wider implications? Yes, well it's 11 o'clock at Westminster Abbey, the, the Queen's funeral. Um, it's also of course a, a public holiday. Um, you know, last week we had a new Prime Minister, we were worried about the cost of living crisis and energy prices soaring. Those things still matter, don't they? And an unexpected bank holiday might not be very helpful to some people. So we're quite interested in the nuance of this and, and whether people would like to get in touch with us again. It's hello BBC London at bbc.co.uk. But we know, don't we, that London will give the Queen a very fond and heartfelt uh, farewell. Okay, poignant words. Wendy, thank you very much indeed. Wendy Hurrell there. And Wendy mentioned uh, that email address because uh, thank you so much for sending uh, some of your memories uh, of the Queen in already. Check, check out this one from Dave Morris in Southend. Thank you, Dave. It's taken in 1993 when he was in the RAF in Cyprus. And he said at the time um, he was hiding behind a post because he was working in overalls. But as you can see from the picture, uh, the Queen saw him and waved and smiled. That is uh, just lovely. Uh, and talking of sharing memories, um, some young people who met the Queen have been talking to us because we know that she's uh, passionate about championing the next generation. Well, Sonia Jessup has been hearing from some of the winners of the Queen's Young Leaders Awards and why it meant so much to them. Has it hasn't been an interesting experience to be here. Yeah, definitely. I mean I think even for my sort of community and people around me, there was a sort of possibility element, which is, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, you know, young black man from Croydon has been able to, you know, get an award from the Queen. <laughs> from Croydon to Buckingham Palace, the Queen's Young Leaders Awards recognise the work of young people across the Commonwealth, making a difference to their community. It was a real acknowledgement, number one, that young people are important and that young people's thoughts and their dreams but also like their work is important there's a real recognition of that and i think uh, the fact that even has she gave the awards herself you know normally if, if you get another honor or something you don't know which part of the royal family is but she really made an effort to make sure that it was her who gave the awards it was so important for me to galvanize a bunch of young people to come together and have a great conversation about how we can actually change the world from a, from a youth-led perspective mm -hmm.
Harry was recognised for setting up Youth for Change, a group which empowered young people to tackle FGM and force marriage. I sort of went up and, you know, and then, and then she just asked me, you know, like what, um, um, I've heard that you've done amazing work. Um, and then I just explained the fact that obviously I work uh, on violence against women and girls and I specifically focus on engaging men and boys in that. And she said, yeah, we need to do more of that um, because it's really important. For Leanne Armitage, another award winner, recognition from the Queen was also very special. I felt like that moment encapsulated everything that I stand for, that irrespective of your background you can achieve great things because I just was thinking what are the chances of this that I would be meeting Her Majesty to receive an award at the age of 23 so it was a spectacular moment. <laughs> Leanne from Peckham, now a junior doctor, created a charity to help young people from deprived communities and ethnic minority backgrounds get into medicine. She says the Queen's support helped boost her work and that of so many others. It didn't just stop at the award, we're still connected to that network, we still empower each other, we still share our work and we're still, we're still continuing what we started, so it, it will be a very powerful legacy. Over four years, the Queen recognised and supported 240 young leaders. It's hoped they'll continue to make a difference for generations to come. Sonia Jessup, BBC London. Well, someone else recognised by the Queen's Young Leaders Awards is Alex Holmes. Lovely to be with you this evening. Uh, the weather, perhaps typically British, yes. so um, an even more appreciative thank you. Um, tell us what you won the award for. Yes, yeah, so I received the Queen's Young Leaders Award for my anti-bullying programme. When I was younger, I experienced bullying. It did make me feel upset, unsafe, uncomfortable. Mm. And I started a peer-to-peer -peer support program called Anti-Bullying Ambassadors. These are young people who stand up and tackle all forms of discrimination. And uh, it's spread across Greece, Miami, all across the world, as well as in the UK and Ireland. And I received the Queen's Young Leaders Award. Wow, and you've trained 35,000 young people, as you say, across the world. Yeah, 35,000 young people in schools, making school a place where we spend 11,000 hours of our life a much safer and happier place. And just to remind people at home, you know, these Young Leader Awards, they recognise uh, exceptional people, uh, 18 to 29, from across the Commonwealth who are using their skills to transform, you know, the lives of people in their community. So when you were there at 29, mm. meeting the Queen and getting this award, how did that feel? I was really nervous. But I can tell you that the Queen is very good at banter because she, <laughs> banter. Cracked, yeah, she cracked a joke. So she said to me, well, you haven't had to travel far, have you? And then we both laughed. It kind of put us both at ease yeah. because compared to the other young people from 53 Commonwealth countries in the room, I hadn't had to come very far today. Yeah, um, and I think that's something that the Queen was really good at. She was able to connect. And there's not many people that in a room full, full of young people from across the globe could say, I have visited your country. She could, she could connect. We yeah. talked about the issue of bullying. We talked about her grandson, Prince William, who I've done quite a lot of work with yeah. on this, bullying and mental health. And she was able to connect with me and many other young people on the issues that matter to them. Yeah, and that, that issue of connection, you know, a really important one given the, the institution of the monarchy. What do you think it is, you know, about uh, the late Queen that really did connect with people mm. so young, other than her Paddington Bear sketch, of course. <laughs> of course, yeah, and that, and that was a complete surprise, I think, to most of her yeah. family. Um, I think this programme was unique, the Queen's Young Leaders programme, because it was for 18 to 29 year olds. Her Majesty recognised that the Commonwealth has a third of the world's population, and over a billion of those are young people under the age of 30. So I think for other young leaders across the Commonwealth, we could look up to her. She was an example of service, of duty, um, and she also did a first. She allowed the ceremony from Buckingham Palace to be live streamed on social media. Yeah. She'd never allowed that before, but she recognised that young leaders communicate differently. Um, so it was really special in that sense as well. And as a Londoner, I mean, a lot of the events mm. are happening here. Um, how do you think the capital will feel over the coming days, especially? Yeah, just walking here today, you can really see uh, just the, the commitment of people coming out with, with their umbrellas. And I think uh, it is going to be emotional. But for us and the Queen's Young Leaders and there's a whole network, I think we think about the legacy the University of Cambridge course that we got out of this as well, studying leadership, and we're stronger, we're stronger leaders as a result of going through the Queen's Young Leaders Programme. Okay, uh, lovely to hear your anecdotes and your experience. Alex Holmes, thank you very much indeed for joining us on BBC London.
Alex Holmes there. Well, um, we also know that Her Majesty was a keen sportswoman, taking a particular interest in horse racing, of course, but she also uh, supported other sports as well during her long reign. And for many competitors, her presence at major sports events made a huge difference, as uh, Chris Slade can tell us. The Tennis Challenge Trophy presented by the All England Lawn Tennis and Trophy Club. One of the most enduring images of British sporting success, Virginia Wade receiving the Venus Rosewater dish from the Queen in Silver Jubilee year of 1977. It was one of only four visits Her Majesty paid to the Championships during her lifetime. The Queen was just such a figurehead in every way for, for me personally as for millions of people. And uh, the fact that she never went to Wimbledon was just phenomenal that she was going to go that year. In fact, years later, I said to her, thank you, because if you hadn't been there, I'm not sure that I would have had the motivation or the, it, been able to win, so thank you. The Queen's entrance to Royal Ascot each summer was a highlight of the sporting calendar. Rarely was she happier than when at the races, particularly so in 2013 when jockey Ryan Moore rode estimate to victory. The first time a horse owned by a reigning monarch had won the coveted Gold Cup in its 207-year history. I think what was most noticeable was the beam on the Queen's face. Um, she seemed so happy and I think it was one of those occasions where you got a rare glimpse into, the, into a, a different side of the Queen really. The Queen's love of horses extended beyond the race course. In October 2013, she visited the Ebony Horse Club and Community Riding Centre in Brixton. What stood out for the day was the fact that the Queen looked absolutely radiant. She was dressed in a beautiful pink outfit, absolutely the most lovely, lovely smile, and that carried on throughout her entire visit. She was so happy to be here. Good evening, Mr Bond. But perhaps the Queen's most memorable moments in a sporting setting came in the Diamond Jubilee year of 2012, when she surprised us all by taking a starring role in the London Olympics opening ceremony. We found out that she actually improvised and did some of her own acting in that segment. It wasn't scripted that she was going to be writing at her desk when James Bond came in. And so she suggested that doing this would, would help set up the scene better. And of course it did. It was iconic. No one expected her to turn around and actually be the real queen. Sporting moments to treasure always gained added prestige when in the presence of Her Majesty. Chris Slegg, BBC London. Now, can I just share this with you? Because Viv and Gill, who met Jill, should I say, who met the Queen in 1957 when she visited her first state school in Barnet, appropriately named at the Queen Elizabeth Girls School, um, we had a surprise for them: BBC footage of the visit that they have never seen before. Oh, oh my goodness me! Look at that! I've never seen this before. No, no. Yeah, no. All the flags. flags as well, yes. Gosh, they're so five deep. So that must be the Meadway. That's the car arriving. It's a cold day, like the look of it. And they're all wrapped up, aren't yes. they? With their flags. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, goodness me, look at that. That's her. Lovely summer. Well, look at the people gathering nearby. Mm. You could hear the cheers and the claps as we came down through Barnet. And uh, so we obviously got quite excited then and uh, in our right places. I felt it was probably unreal. I wanted to take it all in and try and remember, but it was quite fleeting, really. My mother was very, very excited, and, um, and my dad. My brother wasn't interested at all. She had the most beautiful red velvet coat with a very slender waist, and she was much smaller than I was expecting, but she just looked so beautiful in that red velvet. Then we all met up in the hall, didn't we? And then she swept down, and the, the work, all the curtsies went down like a Mexican wave. You mm -hmm. could hardly believe it. No. Yes. yes. No. And then it was on my birthday as well, the 19th of November. <laughs> <laughs> I was in charge of opening the door when she came <laughs> in, doing the customary curtsy, which we'd been practicing for weeks. She was presented with presents for Charles and Anne, because mm -hmm. she only had the two children at yes. that time. Yeah. Um, Anne got. Dolls. Poor Charles, I always felt sorry for him. The, yes. the geography department did a relief map 
on a board of cheem. I was thinking a nine-year-old boy wouldn't have been over-impressed mm. with getting a relief map for a present, but it was a very special day. Viv and Jill, they're sharing their memories. And do keep uh, your memories, photos and videos coming in to us. Our email address is hello BBC London at BBC dot co dot uk and by the way um there is plenty more information on the queen's state funeral uh, day to day guide and other questions including travel uh, whether the shops will be open all on the bbc london website where you can also uh, catch up on all the other news here in the capital probably including the weather as well um, as you can see the crowds still slowly growing here the umbrellas are up waiting very very patiently and on that note uh, of umbrellas up uh, and the weather i think it's time uh, to catch up with how the weather is looking with elizabeth rizzini uh, who is in the studio <laughs> Indeed I am Rose in the warm and the dry studio. Well it's not too cold outside at least and not chilly at all but things will be turning chillier over the next few days or so. Now tomorrow we've still got a rather damp start to the day. It's obviously been very wet today uh, but it will turn drier and brighter as we head through the afternoon. So for Her Majesty's procession then we are expecting some sunny spells and it will be dry by then too. Uh, so scenes more like this really I think outside Buckingham Palace by the time we do get into the uh, second half of the day tomorrow. Let's just take a look at that rain from earlier on. So here it is. It's a warm front. It's just been moving its way northwards. It did have some heavy downpours on it for a time. Still some potentially overnight tonight as well, particularly towards southern home counties. And then our band of rain starts to push southwards again into tomorrow morning. It is a mild night. Temperatures between 12 and 14 degrees Celsius. So as I said, not too chilly just yet. Now our rain continues southwards tomorrow morning. Yes, a damp early start, but it's all gone by the time we get to the middle part of the morning. Certainly by lunchtime, we should all be seeing those sunny spells again for the procession. Then uh, we're expecting sunny spells. It's dry. The winds are light and temperatures in the best of the sunny spells could get as high as perhaps 22 or even 23 degrees Celsius. And then for the rest of the week, well, high pressure is set to build in um, from the west, as you can see here. But we do start to draw in a northerly wind. Northerly wind means, means a colder feel to things and it will feel quite brisk at times I think that wind um, we sh are quite well favoured to see plenty of sunny spells but there could be a bit of cloud around on Thursday as well uh, but the clouds should thin and break to give us those sunny spells at least through the afternoon the winds stay fairly light at the moment 17 to 19 degrees Celsius as we go through the afternoon in the best of the sunny spells now if you're planning to queue outside over the next few days or so just be aware that the temperatures are expected to go down so we're seeing a dip in temperature as you can see from the chart here so uh, 23 we got to 27 degrees celsius remember yesterday so that's quite some dip over the next few days just 17 celsius by friday and saturday but what you will have to watch out for are the chilly nights because uh, we are going to see a drop in temperature by night back down to mid single figures potentially uh, even possibly in central london just seven or eight degrees on friday and into the weekend Riz. And that is all from us here at Buckingham Palace. And as Her Majesty the Queen's coffin returns to London shortly, uh, coverage continues here on BBC One with Hugh Edwards in just a moment. You can follow developments tonight and tomorrow on BBC Radio London. But from all of us here on the team, goodbye.